board. Yes, we are now recording. I don't believe anyone online can hear any of you because I've got it in my ears. So I will repeat your various questions and comments sometimes. Don't think that I'm just buying for time or something or <laughs> uh, I have to do that for this. Okay, so today is the first of, I believe, five sessions. We'll be here in the park every Tuesday in July and the first Tuesday in August. And we're gonna do something that I've never done before, which is teach Kabbalah. So all of which are just to make me comfortable with me. And some of them are to set kind of ground rules about what to expect. The first is I was, I was properly trained as an egghead, rationalist, mitnugged, yecky, conservative, historical, critical theory rabbi, all of those things. I was not trained or spent time in the seminary, uh, spending a lot of time in, in spiritual endeavors, in meditation, in mysticism and in, in those things. I, I didn't do any of that as far as training. So I, I have no training in it, but I've always been interested in it. When I went to Syracuse and did my first master's degree, it was in religion. One for was actually on Moshe Edel's New Perspectives in Kabbalah, which meant I needed to understand the scholarship of the field and then what Edel was doing that changed the scholarship in the field. And we'll get into that eventually. So I had an academic background in many of this text and the history and so forth prior to going to seminary. And the seminary doesn't teach Kabbalah, period. Um, it's mentioned every once in a while when, as the source of a particular historical problem or an explanation of a particular historical movement. But there is no point in a tefillah class where the prayer uh, you know, El Adon or Yedid Nefesh or Anim Zmirot or any of the obviously overtly Kabbalistic prayers that we sing in synagogue on a regular basis were explained not only according to the Kabbalic interpretation, but according to the intent of the author, right, which was Kabbalah, right? So there's a whole aspect of infused Kabbalah in normative Judaism that has been ignored in the conservative movement. And the younger generation of rabbis now, uh, thanks to the work of people like Arthur Green or Arthur Waskow and others, have gone to try and find something that a progressive, spiritual, modern, non-Orthodox person would do with Kabbalah and bring it into their lives and bring it into their rabbinate and bring it into the pulpit. So Kabbalah has very much a, uh, a, a, a present tense and a future growth in uh, the conservative, the reform movement, the renewal movement, the reconstructions, and many of the non-Orthodox non streams. There's a lot of reasons for that. And they'll teach themselves as we go along. Um, I was trained to have a presumptive hostility towards Kabbalah because of the historical um, discrepancy between what the adherents of Kabbalah believe about its origins and what, quite frankly, we know about its origins historically. So I will also paint that picture and point out where those things are. So today is very much gonna be talking about what Kabbalah kind of is. I'm gonna go through the timeline. I'm gonna go through the major kind of figures and books and, and what was out there and how it got to be where it was being completely intellectually credible, right? From a historic academic university point of view. But I'm also going to go beyond that because I'm kind of more and more playing with the value of it, the, the inspirational value, the spiritual value. And, and I've softened the edges in my own intellectual growth over the last several years uh, between true and not true. Those categories are less overarching for me than they used to be. True was good, not true was bad. I think the Kabbalah is an excellent example of something that neither needs to be true or not true. And if you can let go of those two terms, you wind up with a whole field of stuff that could be really, really interesting. 
and can transform and add to your spiritual life, not only in synagogue, but out here in the universe. Um, and, that, and that's really what I want us to get at. So each of the each of classes after this is going to, in some depth, go into something we do in synagogue that you might not have known was Kabbalistic. And we're going to understand what the Kabbalah in that is and what messages it's trying to teach and try and figure out how do those messages matter in your life, in your relationships, in your mortality or your eternity, into your relationship with the physical universe around us, which we're enjoying today. Right? So I have ambitious goals, um, but I don't have any specific outcome because the outcomes are going to be personal. You'll, you'll find your own personal outcomes and you'll take it with you. But, but if I have an overarching goal, it's for me and you to find new insights about life and new insights in our prayer life and our synagogue communal life that will stick with us. So that when we're doing something else in the future, we'll, we'll reference back and say, there's something about this that I really love. Or there's something about this that's meaningful. Or there's something about the decision I'm about to make that was affected by that class that we took together in the park. Right? So that's, that's where I am. Right? Um, now, the, the disclaimer is, I may not know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and the, the reason that is, is because I've never been taught by a Kabbalist. And whenever you're dealing with something that, that claims to have a deep and ancient, esoteric, hidden chain of tradition, um, if you haven't been handed that chain by somebody who, who ha was handed that chain, um, then if such a chain actually exists into antiquity, you're not the real deal, right? If there's not such a chain into ancient history, if at some point, there was innovation and novelty that ultimately came to be attributed to an ancient glorious esoteric hidden past, then I think we're all on the same playing field. And, I, and my take on history is that that's where we are. Now, that innovation, as we're gonna see, happened a long time ago from an American point of view, but not a long time ago from a Jewish point of view. Um, and so how that, I'm also not a part of, I'm not receiving that. But some of that we see because we're exposed to some of it. Modern world through Chabad and others. So we, we get to see Glenn be wrong. Um, but my, my excuse around that is, but I don't think it is. And I've spent a lot of time on it. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time on it. And the, the, the literature is available to us. We have the books. The books got written and we can study them just like anybody else, right? Um, okay, so hello, Leslie. There's room in the shade if you want. Um, all right, so I have, I have made a strategic blunder in that I didn't print the timeline from my Google doc. Is there anybody online? No. So I'm going to use my phone to look at my Google Doc. Yeah, and, uh, oh, you Rabbi are. Tobin, yeah, yeah, Baron, yes, Baron, Baron Tobin, yeah, Baron Tobin. Baron Tobin. And Rabbi Asimov. Oh, good. Oh, beautiful. So you're all hearing me well? Yes. Yeah. It's actually good. me. So it's Nancy. Well, it's right. Nancy. I'm on hey. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay. So stay online. I'm just going to flip off the screen for a moment. So you may not see me, but you'll hear me because I need to pull up a Google Doc, which has some of my dates and figures that I want to make sure I get right. Did my screen go dark? Not yet. Oh, I still see you. <laughs> oh, great. So that's awesome. I don't know if it's awesome, because now you're getting a close-up of my face. <laughs> uh, OK. Let's, let's put the true, false, or other on the table. When I say Kabbalah is true historically that means that the current claims about its origin and its claims about the actual nature of the universe would be true in other words its creation story is true its fabric of the universe theory uh what the mitzvot are and aren't and what they do to god is true that's what i mean by true like it's all true it's all true that's that's one view 
Um, the second view is it's all false, but that means it was invented or created by people who were urged to not believe themselves that what they were writing was historically true. But for example, there are books written under the name of ancient rabbis. So we would call those pseudepigraphic, right? They're, they're attributed to an ancient rabbi to add authority and so forth to it, and that the person who wrote it knows they did that, right? Um, that would be the theory that it's false because it's not part of the original Torah. It's something that was added later. Um, in between those two, you have what Kabbalah seems to me to be in the lives of the people who adhere to it. And that is, it is an interpretive mode. So I believe Kabbalah is an interpretive mode. In that way, it's more than a midrash, right? A midrash is something about the Torah that's not in the Torah. And some people believe they're also historically true. Abraham's father really had an idol shop. Abraham's father didn't really have an idol shop. There really wasn't Abraham, it's a different question. Right? So the Midrash is, there's a story about the Torah, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Traditional, more Orthodox people tend to believe that the Midrashim are literally true, and non-Orthodox people tend to take it with a grain of salt and take a lesson like Aesop's fables or something else. It's a truth that comes out. I believe Kabbalah is at the very least an active, powerful, beneficial, positive, interpretive mode in which people interpret the meaning or the importance of their Jewish actions. Interpersonal actions, prayer actions, mitzvah actions, and their understanding of what's going on in Torah when they read it. Okay, so we're gonna at the very least accept Kabbalah at that level, and I'll be teaching it at that level. A mode, a mode, I'm doing Wittgenstein here. Uh, huh. a, it, could be, um, it could be an allegory or a system of symbols or a, um, a psychological kind of affect. I'm going to be looking for something emotional in the text. And everything in the text is about our emotions. I'm in an emotional mode. I'm interpreting everything according to that mode, that way of seeing it. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a method of interpretation that is consistent across the breadth of literature or across the breadth of a, of a system of thought. So um, there are some people who will do, uh, okay, one, one mode of American history right now is critical race theory. That's a mode. In any moment of American history, they're going to look at the racial influences on decision making, effects, society, and so forth from a power basis of a presumed empowered kind of racial group and the effect it has on other racial groups and see how much that drives or can be explained to drive the historical development in American history. Marxist theory is a mold. Yes, looking at something through consistently across the way as if it's the thing. Right, so that's a mode of, of functioning. Thank you for the clarification. So the Kabbalistic mode would be, I'm going to presume everything in the Torah is actually talking about Kabbalah. I'm gonna assume everything in the Siddur is actually expressing Kabbalistic meaning. There might be people around me who aren't understanding that when they read and they're missing the main point. That would be the Kabbalistic mode. And we'll get deep, deeper into it, okay. Um, let's start with its earliest, earliest origins. We, we shouldn't be confused. Not everything that's mystical is Kabbalah, okay? So when we go back into the earliest Jewish texts, we go back um, into the Chumash or, or the books of Psalms, or we go into um, books like Ezekiel or Isaiah, have a couple of moments like Ezekiel sees the vision in the heaven of the divine chariot, the wheels and the animals and the wings and the lightning and the flashing and the, the crazy view of an image seated on a throne, right? And wheels that have eyes in it and all this stuff that he says, which is the haftar for the first morning of Shavuot. What is he doing? What is he, is he saying, this is what I saw? Or is all of that an allegory for something else? something that is 
high and light and flashing is considered divine power and wheels that roll on the ground are considered earthly human powers and winds are the things that move between the two. And then I can try and define what are the divine powers and what are the earthly powers and what are the winds. That would be a Maimonides way to try and get at what that vision is, as opposed to somebody who's wide open to the mystical nature of the cosmos can say, those are angels. The heavens literally open. If you had been there, you would have seen it. If he had had an iPhone, he could have taken a picture. It was there. And he's describing what he saw. And those powers are hidden from us most of the time, but they can burst in upon us at any moment, right? And a lot of other ways to deal with that, right? The Kabbalah is going to have to deal with every single one of those, but all of those preceded what becomes the system of the Kabbalah. So they were there. So Judaism has inherently in it mystical visions. Isaiah sees a more stately image. God is seated on a throne with angels in a court around him. He calls out like a king, who shall go and speak to the humans on our behalf? Right? And Isaiah says, I will. Right? And so it's a different vision. But how did Isaiah get to be in that room, in that throne? What is the being and how can you see God? Right? These are questions. So I was, I was taught by one um, professor at the seminary, Seymour Feldman, um, who is an expert in uh, Gersonides and Maimonides and, and the, the rationalist school of thought. He said Kabbalah and rationalism are basically, they have the same problem. They read something in the Torah and it offends them. It can't possibly be that. Bilam's donkey cannot possibly be talking. That is offensive to my intellect, right? Um, or it can't be a donkey talking. I mean, that's like, it's gotta be something deeper than that that offends my sense of imagination. Right. In either way, the Kabbalist and the rationalist need to explain those things. And it's the same stories that bother them. It's the chariot. It's Isaiah's vision. It's miracles in general. Right. And they both have to come up with that. They come up with different explanations. All right. So uh, next. So that's the early stuff. Um, after the Hebrew Bible is done, which is certainly by the third century before the Common Era, right? So by the time you get to Alexander the Great and the Maccabees and stuff like that, there's no new books of the Hebrew Bible. In the period of time from then until the uh, destruction of the Second Temple, there's a lot of Jewish-ish Jewish -ish literature in that time that has apocalyptic stories of the ends of days, divine beings and angels that come and do God's being, bidding. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of very creative, what you would call kind of mystical stuff being written in the Jewish milieu. Almost none of it penetrates what becomes mainstream rabbinic Judaism. But a lot of it makes it into some of the Midrash, some of the stories. And there's one book of the Bible that's got some of this stuff in it. And that's Daniel, who has angels. Gabriel, for example, is in the book of Daniel. That's the earliest source for the archangel Gabriel, right? So we, we start to have angelology, right? During this, what's called the intertestamental period. That's the Christian scholar word, meaning between our stuff and their stuff. There's this literature that's in neither. Um, there's books like Enoch, which is clearly written by a Jewish author. Uh, there's stuff that starts to be messianic in tone. You get the, the rabbis are talking about resurrection of the dead, right? Which is, if that's not a mystical view, what's a mystical view? And that's still in our Sidor today, right? Mechayei HaMetim, that God will bring life to the dead. That means up out of the grave, walking around, eating falafel again, right? So it's a very active and creative period of time. The literature of that time period and in through the first few centuries of the common era is often called the Hechalot literature. And it has to do with images of the divine temple in heaven, like Isaiah, or Merkava mysticism, images of the divine chariot, Ezekiel. 
and explanations of the functions or things that happen or the beings that are in them. This was wildly popular. If you go into the, the uh, Dead Sea Scroll library, you find all kinds of texts with this stuff. If you go into the early Christian saved literature, you go into the Gnostic literature in the Hebrew or Christian form, a lot of this early proto non-rabbinic stuff uh, written often in Aramaic, written sometimes in Hebrew, written sometimes in Greek, is, is full of mystical visions with people, what's called transmigration of souls, which means you're either asleep or awake, but in your vision, in your rapture, your soul can see and go and be elsewhere with other people. Often you'll meet someone like Elijah the prophet, um, we have a couple stories in the Talmud of so-and-so went and studied in a vision with Moshe, right? And, you know, did Moshe recognize us or not recognize us? Or Elijah the prophet encounters some tzaddik or some rabbi along the way while they're wandering. A lot of this stuff makes it into the Talmud. Right? So it's there. Judaism liked all this stuff. The Mishnah was a law book. Almost, it's almost virtually not there. And the mission becomes the study book of Judaism. So the Talmud brings the legends back in over time as it's studying the mission. Okay? But it doesn't really become a, a normative book. There's not a book of the transmigration of souls in Judaism. Right? That's, so this early stuff is kind of nebulous. It doesn't articulate a single coherent understanding of anything. Each book is a standalone book, even though you can recognize some of their references in each other. And anytime you get something in the Torah that is um, enigmatic, it's an invitation for this level of literature to engage in it. So there are four books of Enoch or Hanoch in Hebrew. Well, who's Hanoch? So if you've sat in Shul, you know, in Parshat Breshit to Parshat Noach, and you've heard all of the so-and-so begat so-and-so and lived so many hundreds of years and uh, then uh, died. And then that per the next person uh, begat so-and-so and he lived so many hundreds of years and he died. And it goes on like that a lot. Hanoch breaks the pattern. He lived X number of years and then it doesn't say he died. It says he was mit halechim Adonai and he walked with God. And then the lineages go on with the next guy who dies, right? So why didn't it say he died? So the mystical person reading that verse is going to say, he didn't die, right? Look at the opening you have in that text now. So there's actually several mystical books of Hanoch, which are not in the Hebrew Bible. But I think the first two are in the expanded Christian Bible. Um. <laughs> So what does it mean for someone to be mit halechim Adonai, to walk oneself with God in a context where you would have thought they'd die? Right? Same thing with Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Why do we sing Eliyahu Hanavi? Yavo bimhe ravi amenu. He should, Elijah the prophet should come speedily in our days. We open the door at the Seder and we invite Elijah the prophet in. He's dead, right? He's been dead for thousands of years, right? There's no death story. He rides a fiery chariot up to heaven. His cloak spins down to the ground. His follower picks up the cloak and becomes the prophet in his place. There's no death. So Elijah the prophet didn't die. So where are these guys? So now you get into Hechala, Merkava, these, that there are these divine spaces and places where there's angels and beings and people and souls. And it's a place where you can meet and it's a place you can learn. And it's a place that is holding on to what will become the source of our ultimate redemption of the world and rabbinic Jews now, resurrection of the dead. All mystically cataclysmic things are awaiting us in these supernal realms, which obviously exist. Otherwise, where did Elijah go? What's happened, right? So the early layers of literature 
they deal with Merkava and they deal with Heichal, some divine realm of, of temple or court or kingship or power. And they don't have a coherence around them. And they're usually playing off these biblical sources. The first place we get something a little weird is at the rabbinic Mishnah layer. There's uh, a teaching of four who entered Pardes. So we get a teaching that four great rabbis, Rabbi Akiva and others, Ben Zoma, you'll recognize from the Haggadah, it's four enter pardes. It doesn't say what that means. This is in tractate Chagiga. And one looks and dies. One looks and becomes a heretic. One looks and goes insane. And one goes in and comes out bishalom, in peace. That's the whole teaching. Where did that come from? What does that mean? Right? So a lot of ink gets spilt on that. But you have this concept that four entered pardes, a thing called pardes. Pardes is an orchard, but it's also the word that's the root of paradise. Paradise, paradise. So it's the orchard. They enter this paradise orchard, which then it's not, where, where's their paradise orchard in our literature? The Garden of Eden. Where's the Garden of Eden? It's somewhere east of us, right? And it's guarded by a flaming turning sword. It says that in the Torah. Most people skip that line because it's weird. You kind of blink and move on. Right, but we got thrown out. Adam and Eve get thrown out of this Garden of Eden, and a turning, flaming sword guards the way back. And then that's it. It doesn't say why or when, or presumably that we should never go back there again. But of course, you're going to get to a, a supernal realm of redemption and the resurrection of the dead and the righteous and all these other things. Is that going to be a Garden of Eden life, or are we going to have to stand in line at the DMV still? Right? Which life are we getting back? right? I mean, if, if you're dying, you'll take the DMV line, right? I mean, not if all eternity is a DMV line. That would be terrible. <laughs> Maybe bad people get that, right? But the, the concept here is that these things that hang out there as outliers in the early Hebrew literature all get a new life of their own in a world of mystical speculation, Okay, and notice how it's drawing on mainstream rabbinic images like redemption or resurrection or Torah study. And it's taking those core ideas and it's building them into something. That's what makes Kabbalah ultimately so successful is that unlike mysticism in the Sufi realm or mysticism in the Christian realm where the mystics are contrary to the mainstream religion because they're claiming new information, right? Which in some ways they will see as more important than the main teachings of their religion and therefore a threat to the power structures invested in those teachings, right? And so they get sidelined or persecuted and they get driven into hiding and they become secret sects or whatever, all those, or they become monastic or they become whatever, they wind up off the grid. Kabbalah is actually grabbing at new interpretations and deep formative images. So you can't say these people are heretics. My God, they're talking about a throne in heaven, a vision of some chariot, and a garden of Eden with a spinning sword. Well, we're all talking about, I, we teach the kids in religious school those things, right? So, you, so they, they, they can't ever be kicked out, right? And everyone's gonna be interested. All the rabbi has to do is say, I'm gonna talk about new interpretations of Torah in the park on Tuesday at noon, and the people will come, right? So, so the Heichal in the Merkava literature is, is this kind of stuff kicking around in the first three centuries of the common era, at the time of the mission of the time of the early Midrashim and the time of the early Talmudic layers, okay? There's great disruption in the land of Israel that can't be 
overestimated the impact it had on our history. In, in the 300s, it's a major earthquake in the north of Israel. Most of the cities are destroyed. They're never rebuilt. The Roman Empire in that area is in decline. The economy is poor. There's some fast and famine. There's a lot of bad things kind of happen. And Jews move away in, in Iraq, in Babylonia. 80% of the Jews in the world are living in Babylonia in the year four to 500. Right? It's really where everybody goes. You've got some in North Africa. You've got some across the Mediterranean. Um, they're not in Europe yet. They're really, we, we go through the, 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 the funnel of, and we have an intense Persian Empire in, influence on the development of Calvin. Um, okay, during that time, the Kava Hechala, the, the chariot stuff, really does show up in a number of men. And they don't go crazy, but it's there. And you have mystical talk about that, that stuff. But that comes to light kind of in the, in the Mishnah period, okay? It's early. It could be in the 100s. It could be in the 200s. It could be in the 300s. We have a really hard time dating this book because there's, there's only two manuscript versions of it that we've got and they were both from the 1500s but it's mentioned in other places earlier so the talmud knows this book okay and some of the images that we find in the later version that we do have the manuscripts from the 1500s we find snippets and quotes of those much earlier right um but not direct enough to say, ah, there's a quote in the year 150 in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've dated that text and there's a quote, so now we know it comes from there. We don't have that. We have overlapping themes, similar imagery. Um, the language does seem to be older. It might, some people made a claim that it's Mishnaic Hebrew of that age, which would make it second century of the common era, very old. Um, but it seems to be quoted and known by other people later maybe the 300s, the 400s. That's where it's really showing up. It gets referenced in Talmud a couple of times. The Sefer Yitzirah is a game changer. The Sefer Yitzirah, it means the book of the creation. It really talks about the creation of the universe in a non-Torah way, but from a faithful Jewish point of view. So it's, uh, it, it does a lot of analysis of the Hebrew alphabet as a creative force and a creative power. So when it says, and God said, let there be light, and the word light is an aleph and a resh, it's gonna talk about the aleph and the meaning of the aleph. It's gonna talk about the resh and the meaning of the resh. And, and when it says God used light to create the universe, it doesn't mean he used light to create the universe. It means he used the things of Aleph and Rage to create the universe. And it goes to the whole alphabet. And then it enters is God created the world, right? And we have the Ten Commandments. So we know we have this Ten Utterances concept. Well, what are the Ten Utterances? So you have an old Midrash that goes through and it counts up the things God says in the creation story and it makes them into ten. So now, well, why 10? And 10 becomes a really important number, or maybe it was already an important number. And so in the mystery of the Sefer Yitzirah and the stuff it does, it divides creative powers into 10 groups and it roughly makes them five and five, which we've also seen on the Shnei Luchot Abrit. There's, you know, two tablets each with five. Like this is, you know, obviously we have, when we count to 10, we count to five twice, right? With our hands. So it's, it, it's intuitive that that's how people would the universe as maybe God didn't create the universe with light and just plop down grass, tree, fish, dog, rob, right? That these people or things are dropped into the universe whole, but actually that there's a power, that there's a mystical supernatural 
series of powers, influences, forces that are woven together like either a tapestry or mixed together like a recipe. And that the power of God brings them all together. And out of this emergence of organized power, one of the things, the most visible thing that comes out of it is the physical universe. But that's like the tip of the iceberg of what's going on. And there's all this other world of power and meaning and symbolism that is behind the emergence of life into the universe. Right? And, and Sefer Yitzhak uses the alphabet as the organizational system for all of that. Now, once you've done that, think about the possibilities. If Aleph means a number of supernatural things and Bet means a number of supernatural things. And you have a written Torah with thousands and thousands of Hebrew letters making words that are conveying meaning. Look at the potential that you have for deeper meaning, for higher meaning, for claims of more profound, more true meaning, more complete meaning meaning that really gets at what the fabric of the universe is. And since we are physical beings within the fabric of the universe, who and what we are as spiritually infused matter, right? So the invitation of Sefer Yitzirah is a game changer. It's no longer trying to figure out what does, to use Bobby's word, heaven look like. Like Isaiah tells you, I saw a throne and now you're all picturing a throne. I saw an image on the throne in a robe now you're picturing that. But what if all of that is just a shell of a dynamic play of divine energy, purpose, meaning, and value? And all of that is a hope towards an ultimate redemption of the universe that we're living in. And it makes everything kind of superficial with spiritual meaning waiting to be teased out. A, and that is ancient. That is ancient. That's ancient, not just first century. That's ancient Torah Sinai. That's ancient divine cosmology, birth of the universe. And it's written at a particular time, but the truth were handed to the author. And for whatever reason, perhaps cataclysm and exile from the land and needing to preserve the knowledge because he didn't have a disciple, he presuming a he seems to make sense that there was probably a he at that point in history today it could be a she or they had to write it down okay Very similar. It was probably pre destruction of the second temple, clearly before 70, the common era. Very little. We would have, there's enough organized Jewish Hechel America of mysticism alive at that time in that place that it would be shocking if such an important book were in their hands and it never has a hint of it in any of their literature. So, so people are really placing it somewhere between 100 and 300. But it's, it could be anyway. That could be off by 200 years. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I said going all the way back. But we don't have Adam HaKadimon yet, right? I mean, that's going to be. Yes. Yeah, right. So, so we're going to get into what Adam HaKadimon is. Um, so I guess we'll do it here. So Sefer Yitzira also has this other idea that's alive for a little while, but gets completely changed by the Sefirot, right? Sefirot become Adam HaKadmon re-envisioned. Adam HaKadmon and Sefer Yitzir, one of the things it does is it measures the, the size and shape of God in human proportions. So it, I know you're all blinking. God, God, God is not physical. We all know God is not physical, right? Because we're children of the Middle Ages, which got rid of any physical understanding of God. But how did Christianity get going, right? Because they believed that God was physical and a lot of other people said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. 
right? So it couldn't have been completely outlandish in the imagination of the people at that time. And what we do is we find in a book like Sefer Yitzirah that how long is his arm? How long is his leg? And it's, it's like, it's not monumentally large. It's like globally large, but it's still big. So when it says God walked around the garden in the heat of the day, it means God walked around the garden. Maybe the garden was big, right? When it says God saved us with an outstretched, with a strong uh, arm and an out, uh, strong hand and outstretched arm, it's because he has a strong hand and an outstretched arm. And when we say outstretched, we mean outstretched, like all the way across the sea, one arm, water this way, water this way, right? What's the, the word for God being angry in the Torah? Vayichar off. It doesn't say vayichas and God got angry. It says he flared his nostrils. That's the euphemism in Hebrew for he's mad. Or is it? Maybe he has nostrils and he flared them. The, the, it's, my mind is very clear. It's much easier to read the Torah literally and say God has a body than it is to have to go through every single physical image of God and say why it's not a physical image. Maimonides did that. He called it the guide of the perplexed. It's in three volumes. It's nearly impenetrable to the average reader. But he does it. He solves it. It's his life's work to get rid of all the physical imagery and explain it all away. Sefer Yitzhara didn't feel that drive. It wasn't a child of the Middle Age. It was okay with a physical God. So that's what it was. The rabbis and Talmudic stuff doesn't like a physical God as much. And so that doesn't make it into mainstream Judaism. But the influence that it has has that there's this supernal realm that there's an envisioning of the deity that has components to it that has a mind has a heart has legs and arms that does things has physical impact that becomes something that does later get picked up and generated in the kabbalah so it's a it's a it's a it's a, a pre-kabbalah work of mysticism that changes the game um, it just raises all these other ideas and potential for creativity, okay? After that, we get to the 1000s and the uh, 1100s, and we start to see what we're going to later actually call Kabbalah emerge at this time in Europe. So a lot of history has gone on, and we're not going to go through all that history. But in the, in the 1000s and the 1100s, we have in Rhineland, Germany, um, Frankfurt, Mainz, right, Worms, those German cities along the rivers there, all the way over into the Alsace-Lorraine of France. There's kind of a, a, a growing Jewish community from the year 1000 to 1200. And it generates a lot of literature. And one of the luminaries of that area is Rashi, eventually, comes, comes out of Jewish communities. In the pre-Rashi world, um, there's a book called Sefer Bahir now is going to organize that idea of 10 divine powers divided into five, and it's going to kind of reorganize that and go deeper into that. And it's the concept that in the divine realm, Sefer Bahir has the concept that there's what we call emanation. In other words, somehow there's a source of divinity. Now this, if you've studied Aristotle, there's a parallel because Plato has an Aristotle school that's all a rational thought, that everything is mechanical to an original mover, the unmoved mover, who because of that unmoved mover, everything is in motion, everything has energy, everything exists and the universe. There's another theory that comes out of reading Plato called Neoplatonism which has an influence in all the major monotheistic religions. There are Neoplatonic schools in all of them. And Neoplatonism is defined by the concept that out of the divine realm, there are emanations. Think of them as rays of power or overflowing waves of power coming out of some source. So it's the source of light, or if it's water as an image, the fountain that is overflowing. Marijuana is legal in there in New Jersey. Everyone's smell it. <laughs> that was that's just a bonus being given to you for the class. We're gonna in the third session we'll be bringing out joints for everybody. We're gonna go to a higher spiritual plane. Not true, folks online. We're just kidding. 
I forgot I'm, I'm being recorded. That's right, I'm being recorded. Um, okay, uh, we're getting a waft of uh, incense here. <laughs> uh, okay, um, where was I? So they're organized, so the Sefer Abbi here organizes these principles and uh, starts to talk about them in terms of emanation that these divine principles or these divine powers or influences, and it uses the language of overflow and emanation. The Hebrew word that gets used for this is shefa. And it gets used in the, in the rationalist literature as well as in the mystical literature. And so in the Sefer by here for the first time, you have this concept that divinity is somehow overflowing into the world. Once you have divinity overflowing into the world, either bathing it in its light or inundating it with its water, whatever your image is going to be, then you have this concept that there is a mystical reality to our life that we are constantly receiving and absorbing divine inspiration, power, meaning, or potential. Right? And for a Neoplatonist, this is literally overflowing through maybe different, we'll use funnels, or if it's light, a prism where it breaks it off and you have like divine wrath, divine love, divine creativity, divine inspiration, divine judgment, divine mercy, that these are all actions of God that coming from a pure unified God, which we cannot access whatsoever, there is an overflow constantly towards us of these things, these emanations, these perhaps 10 different realms of divine influence or connection. So the Sefer Bahir plays with this, okay? And the Sefer Bahir sets up a system that it's not clear really what you're going to do with it. Because once I know that's there, then what? Now we're going to get to your lived life. Let's, let's drop you down at that point in history. You're living a life, things are hard, right? You're farming, you're scrabbling, you're trading, you're whatever. You're a minority, you always have been in a land. People, there's anti-Semitism, there's brutality, right? I mean... Half of you were here and half of your children didn't make it, God forbid. You're living that life and you're going to shul every Shabbos and you're studying and you're praying and the life around you is the life around you. Okay? And somebody comes and tells you there's overflows of divine. What does that awaken in you? Hope, not just in a majesty matter if you're up to your knees in muck day after day, day after day, that muck is a is a is a container of holiness, as are your legs and your being and your body and your and your life. And everything you're interacting with is imbued with divinity, meaning and majesty and purpose. And then when you clean it off and you put it on your Shabbos clothes and you go and you start that day, and this is something very different for Judaism as well, for the Kabbalist, for the mystic, you have sexual intimacy with your partner on Friday night. These are all engaging and, and, and experiencing the, the powers of the universe, right? Not something to be compartmentalized away for reproductive purpose, right? But something to be embraced as you would embrace the universe, as you would embrace your life, as you would embrace your child, as you would embrace anything where, where love and life and closeness are attained, right? So what happens is it creates a connectedness between you and God which is the essence of mysticism in any religious form. It's to, to find a connection with a God you cannot see, to feel it, to receive it, to be open to it, 
to hope for it and to transform the importance of this, you know, of the grass and the seeds and the trees and the bird chirping and the mosquito biting me. All the things that we have are, are now a connectedness with a divine plan, with a divine power, right? So the Sefer Abahir does that. The, the Sefer Abahir um, does not talk about what we call Sefirot, but everyone who believes in Sefirot thinks it does. And again, this, this is where we get into a historical thing. I've painted a picture of these developments driving towards building on earlier ideas. And then in the next hundred years, in the 1200s and the 1300s, there's an explosion of creativity around these ideas that becomes the Kabbalah. And that Kabbalah, I'm going to just pass out here. Um, for the people online, I have a handout that I should, I would love to get into your hands. So I guess what I'll do is I will uh, post it on a Google Doc and I will include it in the synagogue's announcements this week, the link to it. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Um, and, uh, and then you'll print it out for yourself or look at it on your computer as we go. But uh, the first, we're not going to go through it because our time is almost up today. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, what becomes the Sifi road and the basis of all subsequent Kabbalah thinking, um, just as a tease. And then next week we'll do it um, overtly and we'll also uh, sing some songs. Um, okay, so if you look at the first page, uh, the Sifi road, you see 10 circles with paths in them. In, in the 1200s and the 1300s, in books written by uh, Moshe Cordovero, Moses de Leon, and the Ari, uh, Luria, Isaac Luria, this system of Kabbalah gets developed. Um, and this is where the 10 realms of the earlier literature are now organized and named. And you have to think of this as being spiritually vertical, even though spiritual things have no direction. But we're going to think about it as high and low, just because it's easy for our imagination. High being God and low being us sitting here together. And then this goes in that picture for the visual. I'll hold up the camera here. <laughs> okay, so the lowest sifira, if I attain upwards, I can connect to it. And through that whole intermediary realm, out the top above Keter, God effusing, overflowing, radiating divinity into this structure divinity this is not god activity from god that is beyond us so it's intermediary but it's not physical so there's no space between us and god but all these things happen between us and god so the 10 organizing principles of the power of God in the universe, instead of all flowing out simultaneously, which is Neoplatonism, and you can connect to one or the other and it's judgment or mercy or love or creativity or whatever, now they're all being funneled through this dynamic system of interconnected things. This is what we're gonna go through next time. What, what are these sefirot and what does it mean? And I'll just give you the hint, if you look at the names, Keter, Chochma, Bina, Chesed, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Shekhinah, or in some systems, Malchut, um, you'll know those words, right? But if you think about the Shabbat morning prayer, Lecha Adonai HaGedula VaHagevura VaHatiferet Behaneitzach, behahod. 
right? Ki ho bashamayim uba arets, because everything in heaven and on earth. Right? Adonai hamam lacha, yours is the malchut, the bottom one. Ami nase lacho le rosh, and who sits and dwells on all from the top. That whole thing that we sing, we sing because of Kabbalah. That Kabbalists who are mainstream rabbis put that into the Shabbat morning service for us to sing. But what's, to give an example of how they're not innovating, that quote is actually from another book of the Bible, the book of Chronicles. And when the book of Chronicles was written, it was not talking about the Sefirot, unless you believe that the Sefirot are true. In which case, when it was revealed to Moses or David or whoever the book is, this meaning was implicit, which is why those words were revealed and David sang them in that order. It just wasn't known to most people to be this until these books got written down for particular reasons later in time because of crisis. But it was handed down spiritually as a secret understanding of the truth of those words from the beginning. Or it's a really amazing innovation that brings life to the potential for a prayer life, that our prayers as we sing, that to you, God, l'chadonai ha'gedula, ha'givura, ha'tiferet, ha'netzach, ha'hod, you have all these powers. Each one of those words takes on deeper meaning. You have so much that you are doing for us in this moment that we were singing for you. It's not just a bunch of words in a song. Each word is there for a meaning, not just one meaning, but a profound world of spiritual divine power overflowing into us on each and every one of those words, a different power. And we're singing that in rejoicing celebration and accepting those powers as we do it and overflowing those in the form of song. So we become part of the fountain of overflow of divinity when we sing that song on Shabbos morning, right? That's the kind of stuff we're going to be getting at as we move through. But without the historical understanding and the setup to get to this point, I, I don't think that I would have been doing you an intellectual favor or, or really telling you what I think is the truth. The fact that this originates in my mind, I think this originates in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, doesn't make it any less amazing, right? I think the Mishnah originated in the second century. I think it's amazing. I think the Talmud originated, it's amazing. I think the Midrash, I think all of our literature originated somewhere and it's amazing and it can be sacred and holy and it can inform your life with meaning and purpose and transform your prayer life and all those things. And that's the new place I've come to that just because I think it's pseudepigraphic, just because I think that the people who have bought it hook, line and sinker and are drinking the Kool-Aid on it, that doesn't mean there's not amazing things happening that we can all have in our life, okay? Questions on the history lecture. You can give it back to me or you can take it home and weird out on it. <laughs> yeah. She, she, uh, panim Torah. There's 70 phases to the Torah. I forget the original text. It sounds Talmudic to me. I would say Talmud. Um, the idea that there's seven interpretations of the Torah. You also have Torah, Dibra, Lushon, Adam. You have Torah speaks in the language of people, which one interpretation is that when I give a sermon, I gave a sermon on Shabbos morning. You think I gave two sermons, one on Israel, one on the Parsha? In truth, I gave 50 sermons because I gave one sermon, but 50 people heard it, right? So what I said is not what you heard. So you all heard, there, there were 50 sermons given on Shabbos morning. However it was in you is what it really is. Because once it left me, it's gone. But once it's in you, it's still there. So my sermon is over. But the 50 sermons I gave are still a lot, right? So Kabbalah is kind of like that, right? The, the divinity is going to pour over into each of us differently, right? And we're going we're gonna to all connect to these Sifi wrote or these powers or these things in different ways according to our abilities, according to our hard work and training, according to our openness, according to our choices and the life we live. I'll leave it with this. I talked with Rabbi Klar uh, that I was going to be teaching this class, right? And you, you all know Rabbi Klar? Okay. It's safe to say we're different people, <laughs> right? Uh, and yet we have like almost everything in common. Right, if you compare us to anybody else on the face of the earth, like our lives are very, very similar. Um, he doesn't talk about Kabbalah, he talks about Hasidus, right? 
by the time the Hasidic movements get to the 20th century, they have so absorbed Kabbalah that they can't differentiate it from Hasidism. They think that the that Hasidism itself is the imbuing of Kabbalah, that Kabbalah is just Hasidism lived, or Hasidism is Kabbalah lived, right? So everything he does, he says it's 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 not really Kabbalah, it's Hasidish, right? Which has already completely absorbed the Kabbalah in every purpose, every meaning, every class he teaches, every devartor he gives, everything he does. Right. Everything he does, everything the Lubavitch do is because of a Kabbalistic understanding that that's important to do. Their face outward towards the world, their, their, their mitzvah mobiles, the tefillin in the airport, all of those things are Kabbalah in action to bring about the repair of the divine cosmos and the redemption of the world. Yeah. I, I don't know about that. I've, I've never signed up a class. Devorah would. I don't know. I, I can't speak for Devor or Baruch, but I, I've i seen Mendy has it listed as an... Kabbalah, well, look, Kabbalah in, in before the 20th century was only taught within certain schools and by certain people. The Hasidic movement blew it up. Because the Hasidic movement said, we're going to take this to the world because Mashiach depends on it, right? So that changed everything. Before the Hasidic movements, especially the 1700s, before the, the Baal Shem Tov, it's really the one who turned this into a popular movement. Um, it, was, it was rabbi to disciple in small groups of people. Um, and they used language like Hamevi and Yavin. Um, the one who understands will understand, but I'm not going to tell you. Right? It really kind of is alluding the teachings of Ramban, Nachmanides, his Torah Parshanut. Every once in a while he says, Bederach Emet, by the way of truth, and then he'll say something. It's not like everything else he says has been a lie. What does that mean by way of truth? He's hinting at there's a Kabbalah meaning here. But he's, even though he's a mainstream teacher teaching for the masters, he, he knows the Kabbalah and he believes it. It's hidden underneath his teaching. By the time you get to Hasidism, it's blown up open, but it was within just the Hasidic movements. Chabad is different. Chabad is an export form of Hasidism. All the other Hasidisms are internally focused on their own sacred community. Chabad believes that it's got to get out there and get you to put on tefillin. All the Jews have to do this stuff because your souls are the linchpins for the souls of humanity and Mashiach. And it's the fact that we're all not doing the mitzvahs that's keeping Mashiach from coming, right? As opposed to the sacred remnant within a Bratzlaver group or some other Hasidic group, right? Chabad thinks, oh, it's all of us. So that's why they're out here. Once they're out here, there's an economic reality. They need to enroll their classes or they can't make a living, right? So, there's, so the classes enrollments will be more open in a Chabad setting than they are in other Hasidic settings where they're not depending on this form of teaching for their livelihood. But Mendy teaches, I've seen Mendy's classes in, at the Chabad Center, not Rabbi Sklar at the Lubavitch uh, store. Yeah, and he teaches, um, he's had courses on Kabbalah and some of the stuff that I've seen. It just seems to be open enrollment. I, I can't speak for them. I encourage you to ask them and bring the answer back to me. All right. So that's it for today. That's the historical background. Any questions online? You guys have been quiet. Is there anybody still online? I'm here, Nancy. Hey, Nancy Fisher's yeah. here. Good to hear you. Barry is here. Barry and, and Yaffe, you made it to the end. Rabbi Asakoff, maybe? No, no, I, I, was on his, I was on his computer. Oh, you were on his computer. I see. Yeah, okay, yeah. very good. And Carol. Right. Right. And Carol Golub, very nice. And Jerry. Uh, and Jerry, uh, you know, right. Rabbi, I, um, I do have a question. You don't, you can save it for an, uh, another week, but uh, I'd like to know the connection between Kabbalah and the, the Musar movement. Oh, the connection between Kabbalah and Musar. We'll do that next week. Mm -hmm. We talk about Kabbalah, Musar, and Midnaged, and then we're going to really get into the Sefirot, and we're going to probably look at either Anim Zmirot or Yadid Nefesh, one of those next week. Okay, that's it. You can hand your, your packets back in, or you can keep them and bring them back. And I'll have them posted online for the people at home. Take care, everybody. Okay.
Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.